to start off this morning with a question, and the question is this, how big is your God? <laughs> how big is your God? Because you know when, when boys are little, now the ladies don't know any of this. Let me share a secret. When boys are little, my dad's bigger than your dad. And, and they'll constantly compare their, their, their fathers, you know. And, and my, my dad is stronger. And my dad is faster. And he's smarter. And if they run out of, out of options, well, maybe then they'll go do, well, my dad is funnier. And if they completely run out of options, my dad is, is fatter. <laughs> and if he jumps on your dad, your dad will never get up again. <laughs> And so this morning, I don't actually want to know about your earthly father, but I do want to know about your heavenly father. Do you have a big God or a small God? So, well, Leonard, what does that have to do with it? Everything. Because how you see, how you perceive God will affect every area of your life. It'll affect your prayer life. It'll affect your faith. It'll, it'll affect how you handle stress and pressure and, and disappointments. It, it'll affect every area of your life. And so if, if you see God as, as, as a little God, then when problems come your way and, and they come to, to all of us, then guess what happens? Your problems will always be bigger than your God because you, you have this little God mentality. And your problems are always going to be bigger. And so guess what? You're going to be filled with, with, with uh, uh, fear and anxiety and worry and, and all of those things. But if you serve a big God, then it doesn't matter what problems come your way. You're going to be able to face those with faith and hope and with confidence because you serve a big God. And so how we see our God affects every area of our lives. A.W. Tozer, he used to be a very famous preacher in the early 1900s. And he said this, he says, What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to mind when we think about God is the most important thing. So if you think that God is good, it's going to reflect in your life. Others will see it. If you think that God is loving and kind and gracious, it's, it's going to reflect. And so the lives we live and the decisions we make are simply a reflection of, of our God, how we see and how we experience God. And so how we pray is certainly a reflection of how big our God is. How stressed we are is a reflection of that. Can you see how important it is to have the right image on the inside and, and to know just how big and how powerful our, our God is? You know, we, we send our children to school to gain knowledge. They gain some life experience, of course, and some teamwork and so on, especially if they're involved in sport. But the main reason we send them is for knowledge, and I guess because it's law, because we have to. And I think it's good. I think we need to send them. The sad thing is the only knowledge really that we give them is, is uh, accountancy and, 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 and geography and math and science and, and those things. And we don't give them anything. We don't really teach them about the greatness of God. And I think the greatest knowledge we can give our kids is the knowledge of how great their God is. Because if we can give them the right foundation from a very early age, we're setting them up for success for the rest of their lives. So where do we get this, this knowledge? How do we make sure that our perspective is right? The, the most common place is right here in the Word. One of the main reasons God has given us the Word is, is basically just to reveal who He is. God reveals Himself to us through Scripture. And so if, if you don't know Scripture, you're not going to know God. One of the best ways to get to know God is, is through Scripture. And so every time I read the Bible... I discover something new about God. And it may not be something that I don't, didn't know at all. It may just be another layer 
of what I already knew, another layer of his love or another layer of forgiveness or goodness or grace or mercy or or whatever it is. And so I was recently reading in the Gospel of Luke and and, and Luke mentioned something very significant about the crucifixion. He mentioned something that all three other gospel writers don't even mention at all. And so as I read that, I, I was just, and I'm reading about the crucifixion, this thought came to mind. I wonder what Jesus was thinking while he was being crucified. Because remember, it, it took hours. Because think about it, they'd lied about him. They'd falsely accused him. And then they went and, 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 and they'd beaten him and, 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 and cursed him and spat upon him and, and really just treated him badly. And, and then after that, of course, you know, he was tried for a crime that he didn't even commit. I, I think his, his trial was a mockery of a trial, to say the least. And then, of course, he was sentenced to death. For, for what? <laughs> sentenced to be crucified. And so it was probably some of the most brutal, unfair treatment that any human being could face. And I'm, and I'm reading this stuff, and I'm trying to put myself in, in, in what he was going through. And I'm wondering, I wonder what Jesus was thinking. And as I'm reading the Gospel of Luke, it doesn't tell us for sure, but it does give us a hint. Because one of the first things Jesus says, and this is, this is what Luke tells us, what the others don't tell us. Jesus prays. And he says, Father, I pray you strike them with lightning. No, he doesn't do that. <laughs> he, does, he doesn't do that. Some of you are going, I really didn't see that. <laughs> no, you wouldn't have because not there. He prays. He says, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. The first thing he does is forgiveness. There's no self-pity. And, and I mean, that's the first thing you and I do. But you know, look at me and what I've been through. And this is unfair. And it's just a whole lot of self-pity. Doesn't go there. He doesn't rehash it. Tell his heavenly father how bad they've been treating him and how unfair this whole thing is. He does nothing like that. He forgives. The first thing he does is he forgives. And the thing that stands out, he just, he does it immediately. And so when, when you and I face stuff, we've got to learn the first thing to do is, is, is just forgive. Don't wait until you feel better or until, you know, you've cooled down because generally you and I will not feel better. It gets worse, isn't it? Come on, let's be honest. It gets worse. And so the more you and I think about it, Man, I can't believe they did that. What a cheek. You know, I can't believe they said it. Can't believe they posted it. And, and on and on it goes. Why? Because it gets worse. You see, unforgiveness has got a way of, of festering, building up on the inside. And so you and I have just got to learn to, to let it go quickly. And Jesus does this. Straight away. Straight away. He forgives before it can build up and before he can get angry and before he lets that thing go. And and I look at that, I'm reading scripture and, and it just hits me again. But then it struck me, it was because of his love. Because he says, Father, forgive them for, for, for they don't even know what they're doing. He says, it's as if he's saying, Father, you know, this is, this is a feeding frenzy. And they just all in this thing together. They don't even really know what's happening. Just forgive them, Lord. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 145. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. Notice it doesn't say he doesn't get angry. He's slow to get angry. Why? Because he's filled with unfailing love. And it's that unfailing love that causes him to say to his father, Lord, Oh, oh God, forgive them, all right? And then listen to verse 9. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all His creation. And so the more time you and I spend in Scripture, the more we get to know God. And you start reading, you start looking almost behind the scenes, 
and you start realizing just how good, just how loving, just how gracious God is. Let me read to you quickly just one or two scriptures from uh, Romans chapter 11. And it talks about the greatness of God. Because remember the title today is, Do You Serve a Big God or a Small God? How big is your God? So listen to verse 33. It says, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand His decisions and His ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? The answer, of course, is no one. Who knows enough to give Him advice? No one. And who's given Him so much that He needs to pay it back? (laughs) No one. For everything comes from Him and exists by His power and is intended for His glory. All glory to Him forever. Amen. Listen, friends, as a Christian, the issue is never the size of our problem, but the size of our God. And what inhibits people from coming to God and asking God for something big or a big breakthrough or a miracle or something like that is is not the problem because we all face problems and sometimes they're big and sometimes they're small. It's the fact that they're focusing on the problem instead of on on God. Isn't this exactly what Peter did? He starts thinking, why? Because he's focusing on the size of the waves. It wasn't the size of of his God. Jesus was there. If only he had raised his eyes and put it back on Jesus, he'd be all right. But he'd been, he'd, he'd put his eyes squarely, his focus on the problems. And, and maybe for some of you today, you find yourself there. You, you're focusing on, on the big problems you have. You have a big overdraft. Or you, have, you face a big opposition company. Or a big mother-in-law. No, I'm just joking. All right. <laughs> but you, the problem is you face, you, you're focusing on the big problem rather than the big God. And you and I need to get our perspective back. How do we do that? Through the Word. Go back to the Word. And so I want to do that this morning, and I want to spend a little bit of time on Psalm 139. You say, why Psalm 139? Because Psalm 139 probably gives us the most exhaustive description in the Bible of the greatness of God. And so let's just spend a little bit of time. And for some of you, I'd recommend, maybe you just need to read this during the week and just go through it. And so let's see what David says. It's it's a psalm written by David. And and we're going to read not the whole thing, but we're going to read most of it. And so let's, let's look at what he says here. He says, oh Lord, you've examined my heart and know everything. He has a, he has a clue for us. He says, you know everything. Let me give you a hint. He's going to talk about God's omniscience. What is that? The fact that God knows everything. So listen to the next couple of verses because he stays on this theme. He says, God, you just, you know everything. He says, you know when I sit down or when I stand up, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say uh, even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. And so he's talking about God's omniscience here. God you just, you're so great. God, you're so big. God, you know everything. What is he doing? Is he making God bigger than he is? In his own mind. In his own mind, there's the key. We can't make God bigger than he is because God's big and God's awesome. But we've got to make him bigger in our own mind. So in other words, bring him up to size. And this is what David is doing. He's saying, God, You just know everything. And then he changes gears as it were. Now listen to where he goes. He says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. What is he doing? He's describing God's omnipresence. The fact that God is everywhere all the time. So 
And the first couple of verses, he's talking about his omniscience, the fact that he knows everything. Now he's talking about his omnipresence. You're everywhere. He says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I, do, if I dwell by the furthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are all the same to you. And so what David is saying here, he says, God, you're just, you're just everywhere. I can't get away from you. So he's talking about God's omniscience, the fact that he knows everything, uh, and, and then his omnipresence, that he's everywhere, and now where does he go? Is he going to go to the sun and the moon and the stars? And, because remember, he's busy describing the greatness of God. If you want to see how great God is, all you've got to do is just, just raise your eyes to the sun, moon, and stars. And, and then you see, but he doesn't even go there. You know where he goes? To his own body. He says, you want to know how great God is? He says, just look at yourself. Listen to what he says. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it beautiful? Now listen, just think about this for a moment. David didn't have Google, didn't have the internet, didn't have the resources to study human anatomy and all of that. He had no idea what you and I know today. And yet he looks at his body and he says, there's got to be a God. And this God is absolutely awesome. Listen, when you and I Look at all the complex systems because we've got Google and we've got the internet and all of that. And we start looking at, at, at the complex systems, our resp respiratory system and digestive system and, and skeletal system. And there are like 13 others. You look at all of that and you look at that and you realize there's got to be a God. There's got to be a God. And the fact that I can smell and I can taste and I can speak and I can hear and I can see and I can think and reason, and memorize, there's got to be a God. What about all the various cells in my body, and the muscles working together to move everything around, my veins and my arteries? There's got to be a God. And so David looks at all of this, and he says, he says, I didn't come together because of fate, or accident, or coincidence, or even because of the Big Bang. I came together because of a big God. There's a big God out there. Do you know that scientists say that our brain can store a hundred trillion facts? Your mind can handle 15,000 decisions. Not an hour, not a minute, apparently a second. It's got to be the female mind. <laughs> the nose. <laughs> the nose can smell up to 10,000 different odors. The touch can detect an, an, an item, a fraction of the thickness of a human hair. We, we can feel there's, there's something. Uh, the tongue is covered by 8,000 taste buds and can taste something that's diluted. One to two million parts of water, we can taste that. If you ever thought that all of this came together by some evolutionary accident, <laughs> think again. There's got to be a God, and He's a big God, and He's a powerful God. But more than that, let me say to you, and this is the amazing part, He's interested in you and me. He is so big and so powerful David says, the thing that blows my mind 
is that he takes an interest in you and me. How, how can that be? Listen to what Scripture says. And we keep on reading in Psalm 139, verse 17, David says this, How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. So in other words, you think about me so much. Well, I can't even number that. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Listen, if this wasn't true, think about this. God wouldn't have allowed it in Scripture. That's how much God thinks about us. And so God isn't only this great and this powerful big God out there. But God is interested in you and me. And for some reason, He thinks about us all the time. I don't know about you, but that's a bit scary, all right? Listen, friends, there is no force greater than the love that God has for us. And that love is pumping toward us all the time. So how do you know? Well, He gave Jesus for us, heaven's best. And so we messed up so badly that he says, I'll pay for it. I'll, I'll cover that. And it cost, cost him his son. And if that, if that doesn't impress you, well, let me try this. Do you know that God loves you as much as he loves Jesus? <laughs> that, that can't be. Because I haven't lived the kind of life that Jesus lived. I've messed up and screwed up and failed up. I've just, I'm, I'm a mess. There's no ways that can be true. Well, let me share this mind-boggling scripture with you from John chapter 17. And this is Jesus speaking. Listen to what he says. Then the world will know that you sent me and will understand that you love them as much as you love me. You love them as much as you love me. This is probably one of the most incredible scriptures in all of the Bible. And so when you and I turn to God in prayer, we're not just turning to a big God who's out there, but he's, but he's really very much disinterested in us. No, we're turning to a big God who's very much interested in us. He's thinking about us according to Scripture all the time, and His love is pumping toward us full strength all the time. It's amazing. You see, it's good for us sometimes just to pause. And just, just to check, how big is your God? How big is your God? Bigger than you and I can ever imagine. So David doesn't go to the sun, moon, and stars. But let me go there for just, just a moment. Many, many, many years ago, astronomers believed that there was one galaxy out there. Now, a galaxy really is just a collection of billions of stars and gases and dust and a solar system. That's all held together by, by uh, 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 um, gravity. And so they believed that there was this, this one galaxy. But with the advent of more powerful telescopes, they started discovering, but hang on, hang on, there, there are more galaxies out there. There's not just one or two or five. There are two trillion galaxies out there. That's how big our God is. And so that's the big, all right? Let's, let's make it a little bit smaller. Do you know the smallest, one of the smallest parts in the universe is this little thing called a neutrino. Not for neutro, neutrino, all right? <laughs> it's an Italian word for little neutron. And it's, it's a fundamental particle, meaning that it is not made up by smaller particles. You don't get smaller than that. It's virtually weightless, this little particle. And so neutrinos are the second most abundant particle in the universe, second only to photons, to light particles. You can imagine how many light particles there are. And so the, the neutrinos are second only to 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 photons, and they move, by the way, at the same speed, at the speed of light. And because they are near, near weightless, they pass right through matter. It'll, it'll pass right through something, right through my body. And so scientists say, if you hold up your thumb, a hundred billion 
neutrinos will pass right through your thumb, through your nail, every second. And eight and a half seconds ago, those neutrinos were at the base of the sun. It took them eight and a half seconds to get here and to go right through. <laughs> I know that messes with our minds. It does. But my point simply is, that's how big our God is. We, we, I don't get this stuff. I don't understand this stuff. I don't even try. But the one thing I understand is our God is big and powerful and awesome. That's why God says, and this is the last scripture for today, in Isaiah 55, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways than your ways, and my thoughts than yours. Can I ask you again, how big is your God? How big is your God? Because you see, I want to make this practical. Because tomorrow you go back to work, or you go to school, or you go to varsity, wherever you are. How do you apply this? If our God is so big, then what problem do you and I face that God can't handle? What prayer do we have that He can't answer? What fear are we walking with that God can't deal with? Nothing. Nothing. As a matter of fact, God is so big and so powerful <laughs> that He doesn't only take care of us on this earth, but beyond this earth, right into eternity. That's how big our God is. And so I want to pray for us this morning right there where you're seated. And I ask that you just close your eyes, bow your heads. And let's just pray together. Our Heavenly Father, so aware of God's presence here this morning. God, we are just so so moved by you and how great you are and how powerful and, and yet in all of that you love us and you take such a keen interest in us it, it blows our minds. Father, forgive us for, for focusing on the size of the waves in our lives and forgetting that you just, you're just one step away. You're right there beside us. And you say you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so whatever you're facing at the moment, whatever your concern is, whatever your prayer request is, why don't you just mention it to the Lord? Maybe it's a business, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a child, maybe it's health, maybe it's finances, whatever it is. And so, God, we bring this tiny little problem to a huge, big, powerful, almighty God. And we say, Lord, we lay this at your feet. But we come this morning very different to how we have before. <laughs> we come with a boldness and with a confidence because of who you are and help us Lord help us to live with the right perspective for the rest of our days and to know that we have an awesome powerful God but a loving God in Jesus name help us Lord Amen Bless you.